In this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this presentation, we are going to take a look at the books in the New Testament of First and Second Timothy, and then Titus, and then finish up with Philemon. Just as a word of warning, this will be a little lengthy, so this podcast will not be for the faint of heart. Hopefully, you will be able to uh, endure to the end. So, let's start out with 1 Timothy, chapters 1 through 6. 1 Timothy, an introduction. Paul's letters known as 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are often called pastoral epistles because they contain Paul's counsel to pastors or leaders in the church. Pastor comes from the Latin word for shepherd. In 1 Timothy, Paul counseled for counseled Timothy, a church leader in Ephesus, to ensure that sound doctrine was taught and not allowed to to allow popular untruths to distract from Christ's teachings. He taught Timothy about the office of bishop and deacon and discussed the qualifications of those who served in these offices. Timothy was a church leader and teacher at Ephesus, and because one of his duties was to appoint bishops, he himself was apparently a regional officer, or what we might call an area authority. Though this council pertains to specific offices in the early church, much of its application to all men and women who serve in the church today. Paul also recounted his deep gratitude for the mercy he received from Jesus Christ when he was converted, and he pointed out that all believers could receive forgiveness of sin and a call to serve the Lord. In about A.D. 62 or 63, Paul was released from his two-year imprisonment house arrest in Rome. It is unknown where Paul went after leaving Rome. However, he likely traveled widely, visiting regions where he had previously established branches of the church, as well as new fields of labor. Paul's first epistle to Timothy seems to have been written between sometime between A.D. 62 and 66, while Paul was in Macedonia. Paul wrote this epistle to Timothy, to, who had served him during his second missionary journey. Following his mission, Timothy continued to be a faithful missionary and church leader and one of Paul's most trusted associates. Paul referred to Timothy as his own son in the faith. Timothy's, Timothy's father was a Greek Gentile. Timothy had a righteous Jewish mother and grandmother who helped him learn the scriptures. Timothy is mentioned in seven of Paul's epistles. At the time this epistle was written, Timothy was serving as a church leader in Ephesus. Paul hinted that some members doubted Timothy's leadership abilities because he was young. Paul intended to visit Timothy in person, but he was unsure whether he would be able to do so. Therefore, Paul chose to write to Timothy to help the young church leader better understand his duties. Paul suggested guidelines to help Timothy identify worthy candidates to serve as bishops or deacons. These guidelines helped highlight the responsibility of church leaders to provide for members' temporal and spiritual needs. Paul also addressed the common apostate idea of asceticism, the belief that greater spirituality could be attained through strict self-denial. For example, in 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul warned that some church members would apostatize, translated as depart in the King James Version of the Bible, and promote the ascetic belief that marriage should be forbidden. To counteract, to counteract this and other her heretical, in heretical influences, Paul gave instructions to Timothy to teach sound doctrine. This first epistle of Timothy contains counsel on church and priesthood organization. It also includes encouragement to teach sound doctrine and thus avoid apostasy. Early in the church era, theological corruptions were manifested under the generic term of Gnosticism. The Greek word gnosis means knowledge, even secret knowledge. Gnostics were the deep mystery people. Some of the basic tenets of this theological movement included, first, the idea that corporeality is evil. That means having a body. Some Gnostics were even against everything with a physical nature. Physical activities such as sexual relations and even eating were considered perverse. 
Some Gnostics were forbidden to marry. Second, Gnostics believed they were intermediaries between God and mortals. They taught the preeminence of sub-deities or angels. Recall the Col Colossians heresy, worship of angels. Finally, the Gnostics believe salvation comes by secret knowledge, a corruption of a true principle. Now let's begin. 1 Timothy chapter 1, teach true doctrine only. 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 6, teach no other doctrine. Paul introduced his first letter to Timothy by proclaiming his credentials, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God thus addressing those who questioned his apostolic calling. Timothy had traveled extensively with Paul during his second and third missionary journeys. Paul loved Timothy as if he were his own faithful son and gave him many important assignments. However, when Paul left Ephesus during his third missionary journey, he asked Timothy to remain behind to help lead the church there. In 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul again exhorted Timothy to stay in Ephesus and protect the church from false teaching, making sure the saints taught no other doctrine. In 1 Timothy 1.3-7, Paul referred to false teachers who had once known the truth but had swerved and turned aside from what they once knew to be true. In 1 Timothy 19-20, Paul specifically mentioned Hymenaeus, and Alexander as two who had left the faith, explaining that he had delivered them unto Satan, meaning he had excommunicated them. An important role of any priesthood leader is to ensure that correct doctrines are taught. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, I have spoken before about the importance of keeping the doctrines of the church pure and seeing that it is taught in all of our meetings. Small aberrations and doctrinal teachings can lead to large and fault, evil falsehoods. Elder Bruce R. McClunky emphasized the criticalness of teaching only that which the Lord approves of. Quoting, Teachers in the church represent the Lord in their teaching. The church is the Lord's. The doctrine is the Lord's. Teachers speak at the invitation of the Lord and are appointed to say what he once said, nothing more and nothing less. There is no freedom to teach or speculate contrary to the revealed will. Those who desire to express views contrary to gospel truth are at liberty to find other forums or to organize churches of their own. But in God's church, the only approved doctrine is God's doctrine. The church is not a debating society, this is continuing Elder McConkie. It is not searching for a system of salvation. It is not a forum for social or political philosophies. It is rather, rather the Lord's kingdom with a commission to teach his truth for the salvation of men. Anything contrary to or short of this standard is not of God. I give unto you a commandment, he says, that ye shall teach one another the doctrines of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the law of the gospel, and in all things that pertain into the kingdom of God, that are expedient for you to understand. That's from Doctrine and Covenants 88, 77 to 78. End of Elder McConkie's quote. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, Fables. All false doctrines are fables. That is, they are stories which have been imagined, fabricated, and invented to oppose, as opposed to the gospel which is real and true. Apostasy consists in turning from the true doctrines to fables. The endless genealogies mentioned in verse 4 is that in 1 Timothy 4, Paul asked Timothy to teach the church members not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies. In this verse, Paul was not condemning the proper practice of collecting and preserving family records. The recording of genealogy has long been a practice of God's people, and elsewhere Paul made reference to his own genealogy. In this case, Paul wrote to Timothy about fables and endless genealogies as examples of false ideas that simply minister questions and do not edify. 
and as a rebuke to those who sought out their ancestry to prove they were chosen or superior to other people. So that's what he's referring to of endless genealogy. People were getting caught up in pride and looking for genealogies that they considered more royal or superior to other people. That is a fruitless task. Elder Boyd K. Packer wrote concerning endless genealogies, quote, Our purpose for doing genealogy, genealogical work is a proper one, a worthy one. The scriptures contain con condemnation of endless genealogies, rebuking the ancients for seeking their ancestry for the wrong purposes. Those things happen today when the search is made into the past to find some basis for prestige, to make connections with the right family, to run the thread of relationships simply to tie to royalty or to prominence or to lay claim to properties in an unworthy way. We should be careful of this. The purpose for seeking the names of our kindred and running the chain back as far as we can find it is to give something to our progenitors, not to get something from them. We do it so that they can receive the sacred ordinances in the temple. Eventually the linking of the generations will be complete and the family of man will be sealed together. This is the obligation of this church and kingdom. End of quote. 1 Timothy 1.5, the phrase, the end of the commandment is charity. The result of gospel obedience is to acquire charity, which is the pure love of Christ, which one must be possessed with if they are to inherit eternal life. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if you have not charity, you are nothing, for charity never faileth. Wherefore, cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all, for all things must fail. But charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whosoever is found possessed of it at the last day, it will be well with them. This is Moroni 7, 46 through 47. 1 Timothy 1, 6, the phrase vain janglings, Paul was meaning, in connection with false teachings that do not edify, Paul also wrote about vain janglings, which refers to fruit, fruitless discussion or intellectualizing, questions and strifes of words. 1 Timothy 1, 7 through 10, desiring to be teachers of the law. Paul, in these verses, is, the law is referring to the law of Moses. The law of Moses was only good if one used it for the right intent that it had been given to point to Christ. Such as what Jacob says in Jacob 4, 5, Behold, they believe in Christ and worship the Father in his name, and also we worship the Father in his name. And for this intent we keep the law of Moses, it pointing our souls to him. And for this cause it is sanctified unto us for righteousness. The mistake the Jewish people made is they turned the law of Moses into salvation itself, into God itself, that that was what would save you and bring you exaltation. Instead of using it to point to Christ, who is the only one who has the grace to save us. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, the lawless and disobedient. The law was made for those whose faith and understanding of Christ was limited, causing them to be lawless and disobedient. Mosiah 13, 28 through 30 says, And moreover, I say unto you that salvation doth not come by the law alone. And were it not for the atonement, the law alone meaning the law of Moses, if it were not for the atonement which God himself shall make for the sins and iniquity of this people, that they must unavoidably perish, notwithstanding the law of Moses. And now I say unto you that it was expedient that there should be a law given to the children of Israel, yea, even a very strict law, for they were a stiff-necked people, quick to do iniquity and slow to remember the Lord their God." Therefore there was a law given them, yea, a law of performance and of ordinances, a law which they were to observe strictly from day to day to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards him. 
the children of Israel, when they met at Mount Sinai, and Moses went up and received the law of the Melchizedek priesthood and temple ordinances, and came down and saw the riotous living and worship, idol worship, they were not ready for the higher law of the Melchizedek priesthood. And so that's why he had to give the law of Moses to teach them to be in remembrance of Christ. Alma 25, 15 through 16 says, Yea, and they did keep the law of Moses, for it was expedient that they should keep the law of Moses as yet, for it was not fulfilled. But notwithstanding the law of Moses, they did look forward to the coming of Christ, considering that the law of Moses was a type of his coming, and believing that they must keep those outward performances until the time that he should be revealed unto them. Now they did not suppose that salvation came by the law of Moses. This is referring to the Nephite people. But the law of Moses did serve to strengthen their faith in Christ, and thus they did retain a hope through him unto eternal salvation, relying upon the spirit of prophecy which spake of those things to come. So we see that those in the Americas, the Nephites, they understood the law of Moses was to point to Christ, and they used it. And so when he came and fulfilled it and did away with it, they had no problem. Where the Jewish people in the old world clung to the law of Moses, even after they converted to Christianity, they still clung to it and wanted to live it because they misused it and didn't understand that it pointed to Christ. We can be that way in the gospel and programs in this church. We can get so tied up in gospel programs that we forget that all things is to lead to Christ. There is no program in this church that has power to save anyone. Chapter 1, verse 10, Them that defile themselves with mankind, meaning those who commit homosexual acts. Chapter 1, verse 11, Paul guards himself against seeming to minimize the value of the law. Properly understood, it was of the utmost use as a restraint of evildoers, again meaning the law of Moses. This he proceeded this he preached according to the gospel committed to his trust, that is, as a part of Christian teaching. Chapter 1, verse 12, that the preaching of the gospel I had been committed to him leads him to offer a fervent thanksgiving for the grace so bestowed upon him, unworthy as he was. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, sinning in ignorance. Paul was teaching in 1 Timothy 1, 13-16, Paul referred to the saints he had committed, I'm sorry, Paul referred to the sins he had committed before his conversion, and he taught that he had obtained mercy from Jesus Christ because he had acted in ignorance. One of the gospel's great eternal truths is the Lord will not hold anyone accountable for sins committed in ignorance. Paul taught that he was a pattern or example to others of the power of the Savior's grace, mercy, <clears throat> and grace are gifts the Lord gives to those in their weakness and are striving to be holy. As in Paul's case, mercy allows us to repent, which in turn brings more mercy to us. It is a continuing marvel to Paul, as it should be to all believers, that Christ saves repentant sinners. What a glorious blessing. We hope of salvation. What hope of salvation would any of us have if Christ had not come? How could we be redeemed, either temporally or spiritually, from the effects of Adam's fall, except it be through the atoning sacrifice of our Lord? How could we become free from bondage of sin, except by the grace of God and the blood of Christ? Truly, without Christ, there could be neither immortality nor eternal life. How glorious it is to know that Christ came to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.13, I obtained mercy. In the gospel sense, mercy consists in our Lord's forbearance on certain specific conditions from imposing punishments that, except for his grace and goodness, would be the just reward of man. 
No cry of thanksgiving and relief seems to come more gratefully from the prophetic voice than the comforting exclamation, His mercy endureth forever. Certainly, His mercy is manifest in all His doings, His creative enterprise in His hands, dealing in all ages with all people. The atoning sacrifice of our Lord, upon which all things rest, came because of his infinite mercy. See DNC 29.1. Through his condescension, grace, and mercy, he has visited the children of men and given great promises to them. 2 Nephi 4.26 and 9.53. But mercy is not showered promiscuously upon mankind promiscuously upon mankind, except in the general sense that it is manifest in the creation and peopling of the earth and in the granting of immortality to all men as a free gift. Rather, mercy is granted because of the grace, love, and condescension of God, as it is with all blessings to those who comply with the law upon which its receipt is predicated. That law is the law of righteousness. Those who sow righteousness reap mercy. There is no such thing as unconditional mercy. Mercy is conditioned upon righteousness and repentance. There is no promise of mercy for the wicked. Rather, as stated in the Ten Commandments, the Lord promises to show mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. Exodus 26. Mercy is a gift the Lord reserves for his saints and their weaknesses. It is reserved for the meek, they who are God-fearing and the righteous. Because of it, they will be redeemed in the day of wrath. Because of mercy, men are enabled to repent. And when the elders of Israel confess their sins with humble hearts, a merciful God forgives them of those sins. Indeed, the Lord's people may well ask themselves, What doth the Lord require thee but to do justly, and to love God, and to walk humbly with thy God? Micah 6, 8 Justice demands that for every broken law a penalty must be paid. For how could there be a law save there was a punishment? And since all men have sinned, all are in the grasp of justice. Accordingly, all men must pay the penalty for their transgressions unless they can find a supervening power which will wash away their sins and free them from the penalty unless someone else pays a ransom for them. That ransom is offered to all men in and through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. As it says in Doctrine and Covenants 18, 11 through 12, For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffereth death in the flesh, wherefore he suffereth the pains of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen, has risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him according to conditions of repentance. Chapter 1, verse 16, A pattern to them which should hereafter believe. Paul is saying, Christ is, of course, the perfect prototype, the great exemplar, the true pattern for all men. In a lesser sense, all of the prophets and all the elders of the kingdom and all the saints of God should be living examples to the word of truth and divinity of the Lord's great work of salvation. But where among all the prophets and apostles, among all the saints and righteous persons of all ages, could one find a better pattern save Jesus Christ only than Paul? Here is a man who fought the truth, her, who persecuted the saints, on whose hands was found the blood of martyrs, and yet he repented and became one of the most valiant defenders of the faith in all ages. And yet he enjoyed the gifts of the Spirit, worked out his salvation, made his calling election sure, and has gone on to the eternal exaltation in the mansions which are prepared. In effect, he is saying to Timothy, and through him to all of us, if a blasphemer and perjurer such as I can be saved, what stands in your way? 
Chapter 1, verse 17, immortal, invisible. Paul was saying this does not mean that God is not able to be seen, but that to us immortality he is unseen until we meet the qualifications that enable us to abide in his presence. Chapter 1, verse 18, the prophecies which went before on thee, he was saying, at some prior time, quite possibly in a patriarchal blessing, inspired declarations had been made relative to the work and ministry of Timothy. And these prophetic utterances, as in the case with the inspired statements found in patriarchal blessings in general, were intended and designed to encourage him to meet the standards, do the work, and achieve the rewards referred to in them. Chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, holding faith and a good conscience. Paul was meaning apostates exhibit varying degrees of indifference and of rebellion, and their punishment in time and eternity is based on the type and degree of apostasy which is involved. Those who become indifferent to the church, who simply drift from the course of righteousness to the way of the world, are not in the same category with traitors who fight the truth and with those who whose open rebellion destines them to eternal damnation as sons of perdition. All apostates are turned over to the buffetings of Satan in one degree or another, with the full wrath of Satan reserved for those who are cast into outer darkness with him in the kingdom devoid of glory. In this dispensation, those saints who broke the covenant of consecration by which they were bound in the united order were turned over to the buffetings of Satan. Joseph Smith taught that those whose calling and elections had been made sure and who then rebelled against the truth are so assigned, quote, that they might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. They are sealed by the spirit of Elijah unto the damnation of hell until the day of the Lord or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Those whose treacherous conduct causes them to become sons of perdition are so cursed eternally. With reference to the nature and course of apostates and the need to exclude them from fellowship of the saints, the prophet Joseph Smith said, quote, the, the, the Messiah's kingdom on earth is that kind of government that there has always been numerous apostates for the same reason that it admits of no sins unrepented of without excluding the individual from its fellowship. Our Lord said, Strive to enter at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. And again, many are called, but few are chosen. Paul said to the elders of the church at Ephesus, after he had labored three years with them, that he knew that some of their own number would turn away from the faith and seek to lead away disciples after them. None, we presume, in this generation will pretend that he has the experience of Paul in building up the church of Christ, and yet, after his departure from the church at Ephesus, many, even the elders, turned away from the truth, and what is almost always the case, sought to lead away disciples after them. Strange as it may appear at first, though, yet it is no less strange than true that notwithstanding all the professed determination to live godly, apostates, after turning from the faith of Christ, unless they have speedily repented, have sooner or later fallen into the snares of the wicked one and have been left destitute of the Spirit of God to manifest their wickedness in the eyes of multitudes. From apostates, the faithful have received severest persecutions. Judas was rebuked and immediately betrayed his Lord in the hand, into the hands of his enemies. Because Satan entered into him, there is a superior intelligence bestowed upon such as obey the gospel with full purpose of heart, which, if sinned against, the apostate is left naked and destitute of the Spirit of God, and he is in truth nigh unto cursing, and his end is to be burned. When once that light which was in them is taken from them, they become as much darkened as they were previously enlightened, and then no marvel if all their power should be enlisted against the truth, and they, Judas-like, seek the destruction of those who were their greatest benefactors. What nearer friend on earth or in heaven had Judas than the Savior? And his first object was to destroy him. 
Who among all the saints in the last day can consider himself as good as our Lord? Who is as, who is as perfect? Who is as pure? Who is as holy as he was? Are they to be found? He never transgressed or broke a commandment or law of heaven. No deceit was in his mouth, neither was guile found in his heart. And yet one that ate with him, who had drunk, often drunk of the same cup, was the first to lift up his heel against him. Where is one like Christ? He cannot be found on the earth. Then why should his followers complain if from those whom they once called brethren and considered as standing in the nearest relation in the everlasting covenant, they should receive persecution? From what source emanated the principle which has ever been manifested by apostates from the true church? To persecute with double diligence and seek with double perseverance to destroy those whom they once professed to love, with whom they once communed, and with whom they once coveted to strive with every power and righteousness to obtain the rest of God. Perhaps our brethren will say the same that caused Satan to seek to overthrow the kingdom of God because he himself was evil and God's kingdom is holy. End of the quote by Joseph Smith. If anything, anyone in our dispensation would know about persecution and being turned against by those who once called him friends, it would be the prophet Joseph Smith. 1 Timothy chapter 2, Christ ordained to be a mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 3, we ought to pray for those in authority. We would get better leadership. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, Who is willing to have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth which is in Christ Jesus, who is the only begotten Son of God, and ordained to be a mediator between God and man, who is one God and hath power over all man. As you can see from the bolded parts, that's what Joseph Smith added, that Christ as our mediator was left out of the New Testament, or at least this part in 1 Timothy. Ordained to be, be, to be a mediator, meaning, as Moses was the mediator of the Old Covenant or Testament, so Jesus is the mediator of the New, Test, New Covenant or Testament. Look to the great mediator, Lehi said, and hearken unto his great commandments, and be faithful unto his words, and choose eternal life, according to the will of his Spirit. 2 Nephi 2.28 Our Lord's mission was to bring to pass the great mediation of all men, meaning that in his capacity as mediator, he had power to intervene between God and man and effect a reconciliation. Oh, thank goodness. This mediation or reconciliation was effected through his atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice by means of which sinful men, by the proper use of agency, can wash away their guilt and place themselves in harmony with God. Men are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. 2 Nephi 2.27 those choosing obedience to receive the Holy Ghost are reconciled to God in this world and continue in his presence in the world to come. The Savior desires all to be saved, but will force no one in contrast to Satan. 1 Timothy 2, 6, a ransom for all. Because he, Christ, took our sins upon himself, Jesus Christ can redeem us and reconcile our relationship with the Father, allowing us to return to his presence. Restored scripture attests that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He justifies men and women and then perfects them. That's in 2 Nephi 2.9, DNC 76.69, 107.19, and 2 Nephi 2.9. Oh, I'm sorry. Already had that one in there. 
to be testified in due time, that phrase, phrase Paul was meaning, Christ is the Redeemer of all, as was shown to be the case when the due time came by the means appointed by God, one of which means was Paul's own preaching and his apostleship to the Gentiles. 1 Timothy 2, 7-8, through 8, speak the truth. Paul does not forget that his apostleship had been denied by some and takes occasion to reaffirm it. The phrase teacher of the Gentiles and in faith and verity, meaning faith in Christ, which was also the truth, was the subject of his teaching to the Gentiles. Chapter 2, verse 8, as to men contrasted with women about whom he is about to give a different charge. They are not to quarrel and dispute, but whenever they, wherever they are, they are to pray. Lifting up holy hands, that phrase meaning the gesture of the early Christians, and perhaps the most natural gesture in very earnest prayer, lifting up your hands to pray. 1 Timothy 2, 9-10, Modest Apparel. Paul encouraged women to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, meaning with humility and reverence. He also taught that women should avoid costly clothing and jewelry and ornate grooming. Similar teachings are found in 1 Nephi 13, 7-8, 4 Nephi 1, 24, Mormon 8, 36-39. Paul indicated that women should dress as those professing godliness. In other words, women should avoid vain styles and practices adopted from pagan temples and from Roman society. Their ornament is not to be braiding of hair. In Paul's day, the braiding of hair was associated with prostitution and lewd women or wearing of jewels or fine dresses, but good works and modesty and serenity of life. There is no prohibition of women wearing jewels and headdresses and handsome gowns here, but they are not to be regarded them as their real ornaments in comparison with good life. In other, that should not be your focus, how you look in your outward appearance at the expense of your inner life and the life of the gospel in your heart. Worldly styles and fashions and women's dress, whatever they may be, happen to be at any moment, being of the world which those who join the church are commanded to forsake, are improper and to be avoided. Almost always the apparel so involved is exclusively costly, with those who wear it being lifted up in the pride of their hearts. The Nephite prophets repeatedly identified the wearing of costly clothing with apostasy and failure to live by gospel standards. The law of pre precious clothing is one of the desires of the great and abominable church. Read 1 Nephi 13, 7-8. In this dispensation, the Lord has commanded, in D.C. 4240, Thou shalt not be poured out in thy heart, let all thy garments be plain, and their beauty and the beauty of the work of thine own hands. I'm sorry, thou shalt not be proud in thy heart, is how that should say. The principle of wearing modest clothing applies to both male and females of the church today. For the strength of youth pamphlet says, through your dress and appearance, you can show that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and that you love him. Prophets of God have continued, continually counseled his citizen to dress modestly. When you are well-groomed and modestly dressed, you invite the companionship of the Spirit and you can be a good influence on others. 1 Timothy 2, 11-12, Women in the Church the Greek word translated here as silence means quietness, trans, trans, tranquility. The intent of this passage is to counsel that women should support their leaders and not try to dominate nor usurp authority over those who are called of God, called of God to priest, to those are called of God's priesthood leaders. Elder M. Russell Battle, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that the valuable roles that women have in the church, quote, Every sister in this church who has made covenants with the Lord has a divine mandate to help save souls, to lead the women of the world, to strengthen the homes of Zion, and to build the kingdom of God. Sister Eliza R. Snow, the second general release I do present, 
president of the Lee Society, said that every sister in this church should be a preacher of righteousness because we have greater and higher privileges than any other females upon the face of the earth. So when Paul says in there, women be silent in the churches, he was not talking they should not teach. He was referring they should not be rulers. They do not have the priesthood authority to rule under the ecclesiastical authority of the priesthood. Evidently, there was some problems with that in the early parts of the church, and Paul was trying to address it. 1 Timothy 2.14, rather than being criticized, Eve should be honored for her bold willingness to initiate mortality for all humankind. The Greek of verse 14 suggests that Paul believed Eve's transgressed Transgression consisted in her overstepping her bounds by usurping authority to make a decision that affected both herself and Adam. The Greek word parabasis, translated here as transgression, means literally to overstep. So it sounds like it's probably something they should have counseled together, a decision they should have made together. 1 Timothy chapter 3, Qualifications Set Forth for Bishops. 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, Qualifications for Bishop. The title bishop is derived from the Greek word episkopos, epi, which means over, as in the epicenter of an earthquake, or the spot over which the quake centers, and skopos, meaning look or watch. Therefore, an episcopus or bishop, is one who watches over a flock as an overseer or supervisor. In 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, Paul listed several qualifications for men who were called as bishops. The attributes specified by Paul, including diligence, sobriety, generosity, and patience, are valuable for all disciples of Jesus Christ, regardless of their calling. Seeking to speaking to bishops, President Gordon B. Hinckley identified similar qualifications needed for priesthood leaders in our day. Quote, you must be men of integrity. You must stand as examples to the congregations over which you preside. You must stand on higher ground so that you can lift others. You must be absolutely honest, for you handle the funds of the church. Your goodness must be as an ensign to the people. Your morals must be impeccable. The wiles of the adversary may be held before you because he knows that if he can destroy you, he can injure an entire ward. You must exercise wisdom in all of your relationships, lest someone read into your observed actions some taint of moral sin. You cannot succumb to the temptations to read pornographic literature or even in the secrecy of your own chamber to view pornographic films. Your moral strength must be such that if you are called upon to sit in judgment on the questionable morals of others, you may do so without personal compromise or embarrassment. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 2, Husband of One Wife. From the day of Adam to the present, and from this hour to the end of the peopling of the world, the law of God has been, is, and shall be, that man should have one wife at a time, and one wife only, except when God, by revelation, specifically directs otherwise. Thus, in March of 1831, the Lord said to Joseph Smith, it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, and all this that the earth might answer the ends of its creation, and that it might be filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was made. Dr. Covenants 49, 16-17 Thus also the word of the Lord in the day of Nephi was, quote, There shall not any man among you have, save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people otherwise. Unless I need to get certain people down here quickly and raise up seed unto me, I will command otherwise, like he did with poor marriage. But other than that, they shall hearken unto these things. Jacob 2, 27-30 At proper and appropriate times, the Lord has, of course, given revelation and issued the command directing certain persons to enter plural marriage in the new and everlasting covenant. 
especially in the early formation of the church, God needed to get the righteous seed down here who were going to be apostles and prophets and quorum of 70 of the newly restored church. And he needed to get those children down here quickly. So that would be one reason why they would have practiced plural marriage. A good example in the Old Testament is Jacob, who marries, wants to marry Rachel, but is tricked to marry Leah, and then marries Rachel. But the Doctrine and Covenants tells us that Jacob did none other thing than what God has commanded him. That's in section 132, meaning that God probably told him that he is to marry both. If Jacob had only married Rachel, remember Rachel dies after giving birth to Benjamin. She gives birth to Joseph and Benjamin, and then she dies. Therefore, the 12 tribe sons of Israel would not have come down to earth if he had not married those other women and then received the other sides, um, received the other sons who make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Chapter 3, verse 3, Not greedy with filthy lucre. Elder Spencer W. Kimball commented, I feel strongly that men who accept wages or salary and do not give commensurate time, energy, devotion, and service are receiving money that is not clean. He is talking about our employment. We should be honest and integrity in our employment. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. He is to be one who ruleth well in his own house. The importance of this can be seen in Doctrine and Covenants 93, 40 through 47, where leaders in the early church of this dispensation were chastised for not having their own houses in order. In verse 40, it says, But I have commanded you to bring up your children in light and truth. Verse 41, But verily I say unto you, my servant Frederick G. Williams, ye have continued under this condemnation. 42, you have not taught your children light and truth according to the commandments, and that wicked one hath power, hath power as yet over you, and this is the cause of your affliction. Verse 43, and now a commandment I give unto you, if you will be delivered, you shall set in order your own house, for there are many things that are not right in your house. Verse 44, Verily I say unto you, my servant Signy Rignan, that in some things he that hath not kept the commandments concerning his children, therefore first set in order thy house. Verse 45, Verily I say unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., or in other words, I call you friends, for you are my friends, and ye shall have an inheritance with me. 46, I call you servants for the world's sake, and you are their servants for my sake. 47, and now verily I say unto Joseph Smith, Jr., you have not kept the commandments and must needs stand rebuked before the Lord. So even though Joseph is the prophet, and these other two men were counselors in the first presidency, that did not excuse them for their responsibility in the home. Remember, no work outside the home will, will compensate for failure in the home, even amongst prophets and apostles. Chapter 3, verse 6, not a novice, meaning that is a recent convert. A bishop must have Christian experience. The phrase lifted up, Paul was meaning the young bishop's danger is the pride which led to the condemnation of the devil and is the snare laid for him by the devil. So it tempted when we get power and authority in callings to be lifted up in our pride. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, deacons in the early church. The word deacon comes from the word, Greek word meaning servant or minister. The office of deacon seems to have been a preparatory one since Paul did not prohibit a novice, a recent convert, from being called as a deacon, but did prohibit a novice from being called as a bishop. Other requirements for deacons were similar to those for bishops, including the requirement that deacons be the husbands of one wife. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the different marital requirements for deacons of the early church and for deacons today. Quote, it was the judgment of Paul that a deacon that day should be a married man. That does not apply to our day. Conditions were different in the days of Paul. In that day, a minister was not considered qualified to take part in the ministry until he was 30 years of age. Under those conditions, deacons, teachers, and priests were mature men. This is not the requirement today. End of quote. One of the ordinances 
I'm sorry, one of the ordained offices in the Aaronic priesthood is that of deacon. This office, the lowest in the priesthood hierarchy, is an appendage to the lesser priesthood. Deacons are appointed to watch over the church, to be standing ministers unto the church. They are to assist the teacher in all their duties, which includes home teaching, which would be ministering now, and are to warn, expound, exhort, and teach, and invite all to come unto Christ, although they can neither baptize, administer the sacrament, or lay on of hands. Among other things, it is the practice of the church to assign them to pass the sacrament, perform messenger service, act as ushers, keep church facilities in good repair, go home teaching, and perform special assignments at the direction of the bishopric. Many of their fun sign functions are comparable to those performed by the Levites of old. That's from the Doctrines of Salvation, the teachings of Joseph Fielding Smith. So you can see that was a while ago and why home teaching was used in that. It is the practice of the church in this dispensation, a practice dictated by the needs of the present-day ministry and confirmed by the inspiration of the Spirit resting upon those who hold the keys of the kingdom to confer the Aaronic priesthood upon worthy young men who are 12 years of age and to ordain them to the office of a deacon in that priesthood. Notwithstanding the fact that this is the lowest priesthood office, it is yet a high and holy one in God's kingdom. In the meridian of time, the needs of the ministry were such that adult brethren were ordained deacons. That's from Mormon doctrine. Obviously, this is written quite a while ago. And now deacons are confirmed in the beginning of the year and that year in which they will turn 12. A change in policy, not doctrine. Chapter 3, verse 9, mystery of the faith. Paul was trying to say, since the things of God are and can be known only by the power of the Spirit, they remain forever hidden, unknown, and mysterious to the carnal mind, to the mind enlightened by reason, not by revelation. 1 Timothy 3, 14-16, great is the mystery of godliness. Paul was trying to say, why is it that many men do not believe and accept the gospel? Why are there so few among the many who actually know and understand the doctrines of salvation? How is it that only a handful out of the billions of earth's inhabitants know the truth about God and his laws? Why is religion a hidden mystery to mankind generally? One of the main reasons is that religion is not a matter of reason alone. It is not based or comprehended by the power of intellectuality. Because a man has a bright mind, because he is a profound scholar, because he knows or has discovered great truths in any of a hundred field, fields does not mean he knows or understands religious truths. True religion comes from God by revelation. It is manifest to and understood by those with a talent for spirituality. It is hidden, unknown, and mysterious to all others. To comprehend the things of God of the world, one must be intellectually enlightened. To know and understand the things of God, one must be spiritually enlightened. One of the great fallacies of modern Christendom is turning for religious guidance to those who are highly endowed intellectually rather than to those who comprehend the things of the Spirit, to those who receive personal revelation from the Holy Ghost. True religion, for instance, embraces the verity that God is a holy man, that we are his offspring, his spirit offspring, that his firstborn in the spirit was his only begotten in the flesh, that through faith men may become like Christ, that eternal life is gained through the continuation of the family unit in eternity. None of these truths are born of reason alone. All spring from revelation. None sinks into the heart of a true believer because of intellectual capacity. All have the ring of truth to those who are spiritually endowed, who are born again, who are alive to the things of the Spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul gives signs of latter-day apostasy. Let me just take a break for a drink. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit speaketh expressly, meaning revelation does not always come with the same force and power. 
in recording an express and powerful imp impression from the Spirit, for instance, Joseph Smith wrote, Thus saith the still small voice, which whispereth through the piercing all things, and oftentimes it maketh my bones to quake, while it ma maketh manifest. The phrase in latter times refers to in the latter times in the day then future in the whole era of spiritual darkness which covered the earth from the loss of primitive Christianity to the restoration of the gospel and also in the period of restoration itself as far as most of the inhabitants of the earth are concerned. The phrase, some shall depart from the faith, Paul was saying, some shall fall away beginning in Timothy's day. Some others shall forsake the truth after it has been restored in our day with this difference. The apostasy from the primitive church shall, in due course, be universal. Spiritual darkness will cover the earth and envelop all peoples. But in the day of restoration, though individual and groups shall fall away, the church itself shall remain to prepare a people for the second coming of the Son of Man. Seducing spirits, meaning devils, evil spirits who lead men astray. Also the fanatical crazes and false spirits which sweep through whole nations and people as the spirit of false zeal which lead to the crusades or the spirits which unite and impels a whole nation to evade and plunder its neighbor. Doctrines of devils, meaning false doctrines in which there is no salvation. Doctrines that lead men away from the truths of salvation. Doctrines which are contrary to the mind and will of God, and which are encouraged and sponsored by Satan. As for instance, that God is an immaterial spirit essence filling all immensity. That revelation, gifts, mirac and miracles seized with the apostles. That infants must be baptized to be saved. Those are all doctrines of the devil. 1 Timothy 4.2, sheared with a hot iron, meaning a loss of sensitivity for doctrine and others' feelings will burn the apostate consciences. 1 Timothy 4.3, forbidding to marry. In Paul's day, extreme asceticism, the practice of abstaining from physical pleasures in an effort to overcome desires of the flesh, was a threat to the church. Although Paul did not expound on the doctrine of marriage in this particular passage, other verses in the pastoral epistles reflect Paul's consistent message that marriage and family are ordained of God. For example, Paul taught that bishops and deacons should be married and serve as good fathers, that capable adults should provide for the temporal needs of their family, that married women should love their husbands and children and care for the household, and that the last days would be characterized by disobedience to parents. Elder M. Russell Ballard spoke of modern influences that threaten marriage and families today. Quote, false prophets and false teachers attempt to change the God-given and scripturally based doctrine that protect the sanctity of marriage, the divine nature of the family, and the essential doctrine of personal morality. They advocate a redefinition of morality to justify fornication, adultery, and homosexual relationships. Some openly champion the, the legalization of so-called same-gender marriages to justify their rejection of God's immutable laws that protect the family, these false prophets and false teachers even attacked the inspired proclamation on the family issued to the world in 1995 by the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. The proclamation to the world of the family is pure doctrine from God and will stand. Doctrine Covenants 4.9.15 says, And again, verily I say unto you, that whoso forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God, for marriage is ordained of God unto man. 1 Timothy 4, 3-4, Condemning to abstain from meats. Doctrine Covenants 49.18-19 says, Whoso forbiddeth to abstain from meats, that man should not eat the same, is not ordained of God. 
For behold, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and that which cometh of the earth is ordained for the use of man, for food and for raiment, and that he might have in abundance. Apparently, in Paul's time, it was being taught in the church to abstain from meats. If we partake of food and accept other such blessings with gratitude to the giver, which naturally shows itself in words of thanksgiving, that food and those blessings are thereby hallowed to us, so that it is not only a mistake but a sin to refuse them. 1 Timothy 4, five. God has removed the mosaic restrictions where the eating of certain meats and foods are concerned. These are now clean, sanctified as it were. There they are no longer any unceremonially unclean or forbidden foods. Under the law of Moses, there were certain animals that were considered unclean. That has now been done away with. It's okay to eat pork. 1 Timothy 4, 6-7 Timothy is to teach the brother and members under his stewardship true doctrine, which will enable him to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. We are to nourish up Feast on the words of faith and good doctrine. Second Nephi thirty one twenty says concerning faith and feasting, wherefore you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having the perfect brightness of hope and the love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if you will press forward feasting upon the words of Christ and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Concerning true doctrine and its impact, Elder Boyd K. Packer said, quote, True doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. End of quote. Profane and old wise fable, Paul was meaning all false doctrines are fables. That is, they are stories which have been imagined fabricated and invented as opposed to the gospel which is real and true. Apostasy consists in turning from true doctrine to fables. 1 Timothy 4.8 Physical Exercise Paul urged Timothy to exercise thyself unto godliness. Paul then pointed out that physical exercise profiteth little, meaning that its positive effects were only temporary whereas godliness is profitable unto all things. This contrast would have been particularly poignant to Paul's audience since an athletic, fit body was highly valued in the Roman culture, and athletes trained and exercised in gymnasiums throughout the empire. Paul rejected the over-evaluation of physical fitness and taught that reading, exhortation, doctrine, and cultivating gifts of the Spirit should take higher priority. Caring for our physical bodies is still important. Your body is a temple, a gift from God. You will be blessed as you care for your body. To care for your body, eat nutritious food, exercise regularly, and get enough sleep. Practice balance and moderation in all aspects of your physical strength. That was from the strength of youth. 1 Timothy 4.10 4 Meaning, this word refers us back to the promise of the future life in verse 8. For, says the apostle, it is in hope of the future salvation offered by God to all and attained by believers that we bear toil and suffering. Salvation is a study in contrast. There is a salvation for all men, meaning resurrection. They are thus saved from death, hell, the devil, and endless torment, while at the same time they are damned when their state is contrasted with that of those who are saved in the kingdom of God. 2 Nephi 9, 17-27 One salvation consists of immortality, which comes as a free gift to all men, which would be the resurrection. The other consists of immortality coupled with eternal life, which comes only to those who obey the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Eternal life meaning life with and like life of God. 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth. Nephi was a young man too. Jesus was only 12 when he confounded the learned doctors. Joseph Smith was only 14 when he walked out of the sacred grove with monumental, marvelous truths. 
Timothy was probably at this time between 35 and 40, an early age to be placed over other congregations, all of whom were comparatively elderly men. As Paul's deputy, St. Paul was called a young man when his age was about the same. 1 Timothy 4.13 Excellent counsel for all of us that we should be daily giving some of our attention to study of the doctrines of the gospel. As Doctrine Covenant section 88, 118 says, And as all have not faith, seek ye diligently and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. 1 Timothy 4.14, The gift that is in me, meaning the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the right to the constant companionship of that member of the Godhead based on faithfulness. The actual enjoyment of this gift is the greatest gift man can possess in mortality. The phrase laying on of hands, meaning the prescribed procedure for, for conferring the gift of the Holy Ghost. Timothy's gift could also be referring to gifts of the spirits, which modern revelation that to every man is given a gift by the Spirit of God. However, gifts of the Spirit are not usually given by the laying on of hands, as is giving of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Presbytery is just meaning elders. 1 Timothy 4, 15-16 Timothy was to mediate, meditate, ponder upon the instruction he had been given and the doctrines of the church to receive counsel from the Lord. Jehovah said to Joshua, quote, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1.8 In Doctrine and 76, 19-20, tells us how Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon received section 76, the great revelation of God's kingdoms. Quote, and while we meditated upon these things, meaning John 5.29, the Lord touched the eyes of our understanding and they were opened, and the glory of the Lord shone round about, and we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand and the Father and received of his fullness. Let's now go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Saints are to care for the worthy poor. 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 8, caring for others' temporal needs. In 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 16, Paul taught true principles about welfare assistance. Respect and concern for the elderly and widows is a godly principle. And although Paul's instructions in these verses apply specifically to widows, many of the principles can be applied more broadly in our day to caring for family members and others in need. For example, Paul taught that a widow could qualify for welfare assistance only if she was righteous and did not have children or other relatives who could care for her. If family members would assist widows, the church could avoid becoming burdened down. See 1 Timothy 5, 16 footnote B. Paul then warned that if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith, 1 Timothy 5.8. The role of fathers to provide temporally for the church was important in Paul's day, as it is today. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, From the early days of this church, husbands have been considered the breadwinner of the family. I believe that no man can be considered a member in good standing who refuses to work to support his family if he is physically able to do so. End of quote. Although fathers are considered responsible to provide for their families, modern prophets have also taught that families that families' individual circumstances may necessitate individual adaptation. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, A gospel that cannot save men temporally cannot save them spiritually. Temporal concerns are part and portion of the gospel of Christ. Hence, in every disposition, dispensation, provision is made for the temporal needs of the people. The church welfare plan, as ministered in our day, is that part of the gospel which is designed under our present economic circumstances to care for the temporal needs of the saints on the basis of gospel principles. In the early days of this dispensation, attempts were made to practice the united order, 
Some form of this system operated among some of the early Christians. Chapter 5, verse 6. Members of the church who live after the manner of the world are dead spiritually and so remain unless and until they repent and live again as become a saint. Chapter 5, verse 7. Blameless, Paul was saying, without reproach, that the church widows may not be spoken ill of as women whom their relatives ought to support. Chapter 5, verse 8, for a man to fail to take care of his family, including alimony payments, if required, is to deny the faith. President Spencer W. Kimball declared, no true Latter-day Saint, while physically or emotionally able, will voluntarily shift the burden of his own or his family's well-being to someone else. So long as he can, under the inspiration of the Lord and with his own labors, he will supply himself and his family with the spiritual and temporal necessities of life. End of quote. Chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Paul is saying the church seems to have kept a list of widows needing welfare assistance. Hence, they were numbered. Verse 9. Paul clarifies church policy concerning this issue. The widows must meet certain conditions, including age and commitment to service in Christ. To qualify for church assistance under the welfare system then in operation, widows were to be in need, to be without children or relatives who could support them, to be 60 years of age, to have been faithful to their husbands, to have lived the gospel in general as shown by the fact of rearing children, of lodging stranger, of washing the clothes of the saints, or relieving the afflictions, and of general proper living. Chapter 5, verses 11 through 15, the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, of these passages are a little clearer of what Paul was teaching. So here is how the NIV translates them. Verse 11, as for young widows, do not put them on such a list, for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. After devoting themselves to the service of Christ in their first grief, they may afterwards marry and give up their work in spite of the promise they made at the beginning. Verse 12, Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge, perhaps referring to the believer's basic trust in Christ, which widow would compromise by marrying outside the faith. Verse 13, besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. Not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. Verse 14, so I counsel young widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. And verse 15, some have in fact already turned away to follow Satan. So there must have been some challenges concerning widows, especially young widows in the church. And Paul was trying to give counsel on how to keep them within the gospel covenant. Chapter 5, verse 14, Younger Widows, Younger Women. This chapter contains Paul's counsel to young, marriageable women in the church. President Spencer W. Kimball similarly advised those in the church today, quote, I have told many groups of young people that they should not postpone their marriage until they have acquired all of their education ambitions. I have told tens of thousands of young folks that when they marry, they should not wait for children until they have finished their schooling and financial desires. Marriage is basically for the family. And when people have found their proper companions, there should be no long delay. They should live together normally and let the children come. There seems to be a growing feeling that marriage is for legal sex, for sex sake. Marriage is basically for the family. That is why we marry, not for the satisf satisfaction of sex, as the world around us would have us believe. When people have found their companions, they should be no long delay. Young wives should be occupied in burying and rearing their children. I know of no scripture where an authorization is given to young wives to withhold their families and to go to work to put their husbands through school. There are thousands of husbands who have worked their own way through school and have reared families at the same time. Though it is more difficult, young people can make their way through their educational programs. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 16. 
those widows who still have families are to rely upon them for their needs and wants so as not to be a burden upon the church and its resources. Chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. There are times when elders spending their full time in the ministry should receive temporal help from the church, especially for their families. As section 75, verse 24 says, it is the duty of the church, for instance, the Lord says, to assist in the supporting the families of those and also to support the family of those who are called and must needs be sent into the world to proclaim the gospel unto the world. That's why you have the first presidency in the 12 who give full-time service to the church. And so we as members help support them temporally. Chapter 5, verse 19. Christ's ministers should not be condemned on hearsay and gossip. Formal charges should be made through the court system of the church. Chapter 5, verse 20. Public sin should be dealt with publicly. And if thy brother or sister offend many, he or she shall be chastened before many. And if anyone offend openly, he or she shall be rebuked openly, that he or she may be ashamed. Doctrine and Covenants 42, 90-91. Chapter 5, verse 21, the elect angels. Paul is talking about those angels, as Moroni and Elijah, who inherit exaltation and celestial glory. Then shall the angels be crowned with glory of his might, and the saints shall be filled with his glory, and receive their inheritance, and be made equal with him. Doctrine Covenants 88, 107 doing nothing by partiality, meaning God is no respecter of persons. Let his ministers be as he is. Chapter 522, lay hands suddenly on no man. In other words, brethren should be seasoned, tried, and found worthy before they are ordained and set apart to serve in positions of power and influence in the church. Don't make hasty decisions when it comes to leadership. Chapter 5, verse 23, Paul mentions wine. The fermented or loosely, the unfermented juice or any fruit or plant used as a beverage as current wine. Having knowledge of Timothy's physical infirmities, Paul's probably here counseling him that fruit juices would be more healthful than water. It is not reasonable to suppose that Timothy was being told to drink an alcoholic beverage unless such was under limited medical circumstances, medicinal circumstances. 5, 24 through 25. Concerning those to be ordained to priestly office, some are known to be unworthy when considered for ordination. The unworthiness of others is revealed later. Some are recognized as, unwor- as, as worthy in advance. The fitness and qualifications of others is manifest later. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, 1-5, this section contains Paul's counsel that servants should honor their masters. From Paul's insistence on this point, we might conclude that there were some members who taught differently at the time. If so, they were not in harmony with the prophetic counsel of that day. Verse 3, wholesome words, the words of Christ and his servants, words of truth and righteousness, words which teach sound doctrine, words that edify. Verses 4 through 5, how aptly these descriptive phrases of Paul's describe apostate religionists and how universal is their application. 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 10, one of the great purposes of this mortal probation is to allow all men to choose between the riches of the world and the riches of eternity. Those who set their hearts on the things of this world lose their souls. Woe unto the rich who are rich as to the things of the world, for because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures, wherefore their treasure is their God. And behold, their treasure shall perish with them also. 2 Nephi 9.30 For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8.36-37 Those who set their hearts on the things of the Spirit inherit eternal riches, which consists of eternal life. Paul and God are not denouncing being rich as a sin, but teaching the principle of what you put your trust in. The Joseph Smith translation of Luke 18.27 confirms this. It says, And he said unto them, 
Christ said unto the apostles, it is impossible for them who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. But he who forsaketh the things which are of this world, it is possible with God that he should enter therein. What do I trust in will be determined what I give my priorities to. Paul's warnings can be summarized by this statement that the love of money is the root of all evil. Paul also spoke about people who had coveted after money, as a result had erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So again, he's not denouncing wealth. He's denouncing those who put their trust in wealth instead of putting their trust in God. Chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. If we have sufficient for our needs, we ought to be content, for we have enough. Contentment combined with godliness brings blessings to one's soul. Verse 7 is a current commentary on the vainness or emptiness of worldly possessions. Elder Robert D. Hills of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke about how a love of money and possessions can affect our spirituality. Quote, Our world is fraught with feelings of entitlement. Some of us feel embarrassed, ashamed, left worth, less worthwhile if our family does not have everything the neighbor has. As a result, we go into debt to buy things we can't afford and things we do not really need. Whenever we do this, we become poor temporally and spiritually. We give away some of our precious, priceless agency and put ourselves in self-imposed servitude. That would mean making payments, being servitude, being in debt. Back to his quote. Money we could have used to care for ourselves and others must now be used to pay our debts. What remains is often only enough to meet our most basic physical needs. Living at the subsistence level, we become depressed, our self-worth is affected, and our relationships with family, friends, neighbors, and the Lord are weakened. We do not have the time, energy, or interest to seek spiritual things. When faced with the choice to buy, consume, or engage in worldly things and activities, we all need to learn to say to one another, we can't afford it, even though we want it. Or we can afford it, but we don't need it. Or we really don't even want it. Whenever we want to experience or possess something that will impact us and our resources, we may want to ask ourselves, is the benefit temporal or will it have eternal value and significance? Truthfully answering these questions may help us avoid excessive debt and other addictive behavior. End of quote. First Timothy six eleven through nineteen verse eleven, Timothy's conduct was to be in absolute contrast with that of the heterodox, which means contrary to the doctrines of the church, teachers who valued religions as a source of gain. Verse twelve, he must be faithful and lay hold on eternal life, as he had promised when he made his confession of faith. Verse 13, and as Christ faithfully made his confession before Pontius Pilate, verse 14, this faithfulness Timothy was especially to show in keeping safe the truth committed to him by Paul, which he was to do his part in maintaining uncorrupted until the second coming of Christ, which God would manifest at his own time. Paul said that no man has seen nor can see God. 1 Timothy 6.16. However, the Joseph Smith translation of 1 Timothy 6 verses 15 through 16 makes clear that a person can see God if he or she is clean and worthy. So the Joseph Smith translation of 1 Timothy 6 15 through 16 says, 15, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Verse 16, whom no man has seen nor can see, unto whom no man can approach, only he who hath light and hope of immortality dwelling in him. So a very significant change. One can see the Father and the Son as soon as they are ready in righteousness to do so. Verse 16, who only hath immortality, meaning here is an obvious error in the King James Version of the Bible. 
To assert that Christ only has immortality is run counter to the whole doctrine of the resurrection, which is that unnumbered host of resurrected persons have attained immortality. And here also is a marvelous illustration of the inspiration attending the prophet Joseph Smith's biblical revisions. By the simple expedient of rearranging some phrases and adding a few words, verses 15 and 16 shed a flood of gospel light where before there was darkness and confusion. Verses 17 through 19, he is to instruct them not to trust in their riches and grow conceited, but to be ready to give to others to lay up for themselves a treasure in heaven. The right to use of wealth, as of all other of God's gift, while it will not earn eternal life, will yet conduce to our attainment of it good works, not being the cause, but being nevertheless in adults a condition of salvation. We should use our resources and substance to help others. 1 Timothy 6.20, Science. Paul told Timothy to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppose and oppositions of science. In this verse, science is a translation of the Greek term nosio, nosios, which means knowledge, and the term was probably referring specifically to the Gnostic movement that was then finding its way into the early Christianity. Gnostics believed that salvation was attained by being instructed in secret knowledge, called gnosis. Gnosticism was a major source of controversy in 2nd century Christianity. A particular philosophy that was gained popularly at the time was docetism, if I'm saying that right. Docetism was part of a larger movement known as Gnosticism. A core teaching in many forms of Gnosticism was that the spirit was wholly good and that matter, including the physical body, was wholly evil. Followers of Gnosticism believed that salvation was not achieved by being freed from sin, but rather by freeing the spirit from matter, meaning the physical body. They also believed that salvation was achieved through special knowledge, Gnosis, rather than through faith in Jesus Christ. Followers of Docetism overemphasized Jesus' spiritual nature to the point that they rejected the idea that he came to earth in an actual, actual bodily form. They believed that God was invisible, immortal, all-knowing, and immaterial, and they considered the physical world and the physical body to be base and evil. Therefore, they believed that since Jesus was a divine Son of God, he could not have experienced the limitations of being human. In their view, Jesus Christ was not literally born in the flesh, and he did not inhabit a tangible body, bleed, suffer, die, or raise with a physical resurrected body. He only seemed to do those things. Docetism comes from the Greek dokio, meaning to seem or to appear. If there is a conflict between is there a conflict between science and religion? The answer to this basic query depends entirely upon what is meant by and accepted as science and as religion. It is common to say there is no such conflict, meaning between true science and true religion, for one truth never conflicts with another, no matter what field or categories the truths are put in for purposes of study. But there most certainly is a conflict between science and religion if by science is meant, for instance, the theoretical guesses and postulates of some organic evolutionists, or if by religion is meant the false creeds and dogmas of the sectarian and pagan worlds. Oppositions of science falsely so-called were causing people to err concerning the faith even in the days of Paul. There is, of course, no conflict between revealed religion, as it has been restored in our day, and those scientific realities which have been established as ultimate truth. The mental quagmires in which many students struggle result from the acceptance of unproven scientific theories as ultimate facts, which brings the student to the necessity of rejecting conflicting truths of revealed religion. If, for example, a student accepts the untrue theory that death has been present on the earth for scores of thousands of millions of years, he must reject the revealed truth that there was no death either for man or animals or plants or any form of life until some 6,000 years ago when Adam fell. 
As a matter of fact, from the eternal perspective, true science is part of the gospel itself. In its broadest signification, the gospel embraces all truth. When the full blessings of the millennium are poured out upon the earth and its inhabitants, pseudo-science and pseudo-religions will be swept aside and all supposed conflicts between science and religion will vanish away. What a day I look forward to. Now, let's turn to 2 Timothy. A little introduction. Chronologically, 2 Timothy appears to be Paul's final letter in the New Testament, having been written shortly before his death. It contains the reason why Paul labored so diligently in his ministry. His conviction, he had been called by Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Having witnessed the difficulties that false teachers can cause for church members, Paul encouraged Timothy to trust in the scriptures and in church leaders and to rely on true doctrine. Modern readers can easily see the accuracy of Paul's prophetic description of the perilous times that will exist in the last days. The second epistle to Timothy emphasized the power that comes from having a testimony of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote of being imprisoned frequently, and the scriptures record specifically mentions imprisonment in Philippi, Jerusalem, Caesarea, and Rome. In 2 Timothy, however, Paul alludes to another imprisonment in Rome, which was apparently a separate incident from when he was under house arrest there earlier. In the imprisonment spoken of in 2 Timothy, Paul was in chains, and he was held in a cold cell or dungeon, and his friends struggled to locate him. Luke was apparently his only contact, and Paul expected that his life was coming to an end. According to early Christian traditions, Paul was executed during the persecutions of the Roman Emperor Nero. Since Nero died in A.D. 68, the second epistle to Timothy may have been written about A.D. 67 or 68, just prior to Paul's martyrdom. While writing this epistle, Paul is expecting to be put to death shortly. This letter contains his reflections about the blessings and difficulties of serving as a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul declared, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, indicating that he had a personal assurance that he would inherit eternal life. As one who ministered for Jesus Christ for over 30 years, Paul was in an excellent position to instruct strong and alive in this life. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, pointed out, quote, These four words, receive the Holy Ghost, are not a passive pronouncement. Rather, they constitute a priesthood injunction, an authoritative admonition to act and not simply to be acted upon. The Holy Ghost does not become operative in our lives merely because hands are placed upon our heads and those four important words are spoken. As we receive this ordinance, each of us accepts a sacred and ongoing responsibility to desire, to seek, to work, and to so live that we indeed receive the Holy Ghost and its attendant spiritual gifts. End of quote. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Christ brings immortality and eternal life. 2 Timothy 1.1, the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, the promise of eternal life given in pre-existence that the obedient saint should be saved because of our Lord's atoning sacrifice. 2 Timothy 1.2, my beloved son, Paul meaning my own covenant, my own gospel son, who has received spiritual strength through my teachings. 2 Timothy 1.3, God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. Paul had always served God according to the best light and knowledge he had. In this sense, his conscience was clear. Unlike those who believe the false creeds of modern Christendom, he did not have to change his allegiance from a spirit essence that fills the immensity of space to a personal God when he received the gospel. He had inherited from his father the knowledge that God was his father and that Israel was the Lord's chosen people. His problem was to learn and to do the will of God. First, he falsely assumed this meant persecuting Christ and the Christians. 
on the Damascus road, the Lord called him to defend those whom he had persecuted. But he had always been zealous. He was religiously inclined by instinct. And as with all misguided zealots, his problem was one of finding the truth and directing his zeal where the Lord of heaven could have it centered. Chapter 1, verse 5, faith runs in families. In general, though not inevitably, the Lord sends a faithful endowed spirit into a household of faith. Chapter 1, verse 6, stir up the gifts of God which is in me. It is not enough to have hands laid on our head for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thereafter, we must seek the spirit until we actually enjoy the companionship and guidance of that member of the Godhead. Chapter 1, verse 7, the spirit of fear. Paul had been in prison and endured severe persecution himself, so he knew firsthand how persecution can cause followers of Christ to fear. President Thomas S. Monson quoted 2 Timothy 1.7 as he encouraged members of the church not to become fearful about the future. Paul dictating the epistle to the Ephesians. Paul was imprisoned on several occasions, <clears throat> and even when in prison, he offered words of encouragement. It would be easy to become discouraged and cynical about the future, I'm quoting President Monson now, or even fearful of what might come if we allow ourselves to dwell only on that which is wrong in the world and in our lives. Today, however, I'd like us to turn our thoughts and our attitudes away from the troubles around us and to focus instead on our blessings as members of the church. The Apostle Paul declared, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The history of the church in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, is replete with experience of those who have struggled and yet who have remained steadfast and of good cheer as they have made the gospel of Jesus Christ the center of their lives. This attitude is what pull us through whatever comes our way. It will not remove our troubles from us, but rather will enable us to face our challenges, to meet them head on, and to emerge victorious. End of quote. Second Timothy 1.8, the testimony of our Lord. Paul was meaning the knowledge revelation, <clears throat> the knowledge received by revelation from the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those endowed with this heaven-born knowledge are witnesses appointed to testify and warn the world. Salvation is for those who are valiant in the testimony of Jesus. The phrase, the afflictions of the gospel, meant afflictions imposed upon the saints by wicked, worldly, and ungodly people. These were exceedingly severe in Paul's dispensation, a dispensation of persecution and martyrdom. Chapter 1, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Paul was referring to this reverse refers to foreordination to eternal life during the pre-mortal existence. This foreordination or election had its basis in the grand council in heaven. To have this election made sure or certain, we must take advantage of the Savior's redemption. Alma's chapter 13 verses 1 through 8 contains a record of another premortal calling. He is now going to refer to something that happened in the premortal life that we were called to before we came. And again, my brethren, I would cite your minds forward to the time when the Lord gave these commandments unto his children. I would that you should remember that the Lord God ordained priests after his holy order, which was after the order of his son, to teach these things unto the people. And those priests were ordained after the order of the son in a manner that thereby they may know in what manner to look forward to the son for redemption. For this is the manner after which they were ordained being called and prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of a God on account of their exceeding faith and good works in the first place, meaning in our first estate, being left to choose good or evil. Therefore, they having chosen good and exercising exceedingly great faith are called with a holy calling, yea, with that holy calling which was prepared with and according to a preparatory redemption for such. See, even in pre-earth life, you had the agency to listen to the gospel or not. 
you, getting the priesthood down here is not by accident. You were foreordained to it and because of our, your righteousness in the pre-earth life, continuing with Alma. And thus they have been called to this holy calling on account of their faith, while others would reject the Spirit of God on account of the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, while if it had not been for this, they might have had as great a privilege as their brethren. Or in fine, in the first place, they were on the same standing with their brethren. Thus this holy calling being prepared from the foundation of the world, for such as would not harden their hearts, being in and through the atonement of the only begotten Son who was prepared. And thus being called by this holy calling and ordained into the high priesthood of the holy order of God to teach his commandments of the children of men that they might also enter his rest. This high priesthood being after the order of his son, that's referring to the Melchizedek priesthood, which order was from the foundation of the world, or in other worlds, being without beginning of days or end of years, being prepared from eternity to all eternity, according to his foreknowledge of all things. Now they were ordained after this manner, being called with the holy calling and ordained with the holy ordinance and taking upon them the high holy priesthood of the holy order, which calling ordinance and high priesthood is without beginning or end. So were those that were worthy to receive the Melchizedek priesthood in the pre-earth life. And so they were foreordained to receive it again once they came into mortality. Others decided not to prepare themselves for that. Decided, you had your agency in the pre-earth life, just you had here. You didn't have to listen to Jesus and Father when they spoke about the gospel. You could have gone and done something else, and apparently many did. Joseph Smith taught that every man called to minister through the priest of mortality was foreordained in the Grand Council. 2 Timothy 1.10, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. Jesus Christ hath abolished death. What wonder, what miracle, what inconceivable glory attends this transcendent truth. Death ceaseth because Christ liveth. There are two deaths, and Adam is father of them both. First, the temporal or natural death, which consists in the separation of the body and spirit and the return of the body to the dust from whence it came. Second, the spiritual death, which consists in being cast out of the presence of the Lord and of dying as pertaining to things of righteousness or things of the spirit. In spiritual death, existence continues, but the awareness of spiritual reality ceases. Our Lord's atoning sacrifice redeems men from the effects of both deaths. Temporal death is replaced with temporal life, and spiritual death with spiritual life. That is, all men are raised from the natural death to a state of immortality, and those who believe and obey the fullness of the gospel law attain eternal life also. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. But resurrection and life are not one and the same thing. Immortality and eternal life are distinct but associated states. Immortality is to live forever in the resurrected state with the body and spirit inseparably connected. The Lord's work and glory is to bring to pass both the immortality and eternal life of man. All are resurrected to a state of immortality. Those who believe and obey the gospel plan go on in immortality unto eternal life. Immortality is a free gift which comes by grace alone without work on man's part. Eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God, results from obedience to the laws and acceptance of the gospel. Accordingly, eternal life is not a name that has reference only to the unending duration of future life. Immortality is to live forever in the resurrected state, and by the grace of God, all men will gain this unending continuance of life. But only those who obey the fullness of the gospel law will inherit eternal life. It is the greatest of all gifts of God, for it is the kind, status, type, and quality of life that God himself enjoys. Thus, those who gain eternal life receive exaltation. They are sons of God, joint heirs with Christ, members of the church of the firstborn. They overcome all things, have all power, and receive the fullness of the Father. They are gods. 
2 Timothy 1.12, I am not ashamed. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel, for he knew in whom he, in whom he had believed in. The phrase against that day meant the second coming, the day of judgment, the day of vengeance, the day when every man's work shall be tried by fire. Chapter 1, verse 13, sound words, meaning the true doctrine, hold fast to the doctrine of Christ in faith and love. Verse 14, the phrase that good thing, meaning the gospel, which was committed to them to keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us, that phrase meant the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. That is, the Holy Ghost is a spirit man, an individual, an entity, who, because of his spirit status, our spirit state, has power to speak to the spirit within man, thus dwelling in man in the sense of conveying truth to the human heart. First Timothy, or I'm sorry, Second Timothy 1 5. Paul had warned that grievous wolves would enter the flock, promoting perverse doctrines. Now, with all they which are in Asia turning away, we see evidence of widespread apostasy throughout the church. Verses 16 to 18 in chapter 1. Paul pays tribute to one Sephorius, one who was not ashamed of the apostles' prison chains. For one Phosphorus ministered to church leaders while he was in prison and helped him. God grants mercy to the merciful. Those who succor the saints temporally shall receive rich spiritual rewards from the Lord. Timothy 2, Christ gives eternal glory to the elect. Verse 1, be strong, meaning be valiant and courageous in the war with sin. Keep the commandments. Verse 2, Paul was one of many witnesses, and he now hopes that the truth shall go from witness to witness until all the world is warned. Verse 3, endure hardness, rather suffer hardship with me. The phrase soldier of Christ, meaning there is a war on earth as there was in heaven. Christ's ministers are soldiers in the war with sin. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Only the valiant warriors are saved, which do not entangle themselves in the things of the world that oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. The soldier's virtue is to be shown in resisting, one, the enemies of faith, two, all evil, and with this end in view, he will not devote himself to other occupations, but observe the rules of service in the cause of Christ. Verse 6, the reward of eternal life is for the minister first and the convert second. Those who labor in the Lord's vineyard bring salvation to their own souls first and then to the souls of those who believe and obey the witness of truth. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. John 4, 36. Verses 3 through 6, you can see that Paul uses three metaphors from the military, athletic, and agriculture. Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Be a good competitor, conforming to rigorous training and the rules of the game. And be a good husbandman, diligently laboring in the vineyard and deserving the fruits of salvation. Paul adds, is like the husband having a right to a living wage. Verse 7, if Timothy thinks it over, he will see that it, is only, that it is only responsible that those whose lives are given to full-time service to the church should be supported by a stipend answering to the laborer's wages. Verse 8, the phrase Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Paul probably reminds Timothy of this doctrine because of the many false apostate preachers who are teaching the denial of the resurrection, especially what Paul was told about in Corinth. By this time, the great apostasy was already beginning and gaining ground. Verse 9, the word of God is not bound, meaning the gospel cannot be put in prison. The truth of heaven cannot be locked in a jail cell. All truth is independent in the sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no existence. Verse 10, Christ's ministers suffer persecution in order to make the truths of salvation available to the saints. In our day, Joseph Smith is probably the supreme example. 
The phrase, the salvation which is in Christ, Paul means, O then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. 2 Nephi 9.41 Eternal glory meaning exaltation, eternal life, the fullness of salvation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. Verse 11, the phrase dead with him meaning dead to sin. The phrase live with him meaning live in exaltation in his kingdom. Chapter 2, verse 12, reign with him, means stand with him as king and priest, ruling and reigning over kingdoms and dominions forever. This will not come without suffering and affliction, which the Lord uses to chasten his people, yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Verse 13, we have been admitted into a covenant relationship with Christ, and whatever we may do, he will observe the terms of the agreement, whether they bring us good or or evil. Verse 14, the phrase, strive not about words, and verse 16, shun profane and vain babblings, and verse 23, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, and verse 24, the phrase, the servant of the Lord must not strive, all of those Paul is trying to convey that contention and division are of the devil. Agreement and unity are of God. Since true religion comes by revelation, man's sole purpose in trying to understand and interpret gospel principles should be to find out what the Lord means in any given revelation. This knowledge can be gained only by the power of the Spirit. Hence, there is no occasion to debate, to argue, to contend, to champion one cause against another. Those who have the Spirit do not hang doggedly to a point of doctrine or philosophy for no other reason than to come off victorious in a disagreement. Their purpose, rather, is to seek truth by investigation, research, and inspiration. Cease to contend with one another, the Lord has commanded. Verse 15, Timothy is to continue to study the Word of God to merit the approval of God. The phrase rightly dividing the word of truth, meaning not all truth is of equal value. Some scientific truths may benefit men in this life only. The truths of revealed religion will pour out blessings upon them now and forever. But even revealed truth is not all of the same worth. Some things apply only to the past dispensations, as the performance of the Mosaic system. Others are binding in all ages, as the laws pertaining to baptism and celestial marriage. Verse 16, profane and vain babblings. Timothy is to shun anything irreverent to anything sacred and worthless idle teachings, which leads to ungodliness, meaning disobedience, wickedness, conduct that offends God. Verse 17 through 18, Hymenaeus and Philetus were part of those who were teaching false doctrine. Their heresy may have been an allegorical explanation of the resurrection as a new life of the soul which had been imparted to it by faith in Christ. The belief that the resurrection is past already may have been that Christ's resurrection was the only one that was to be. A belief like this seems to have prevailed in Corinth. Or as Satan's ministers delight in spiritualizing away the prophecies and doctrines of the gospel. Probably what was here involved was the allegorical teaching that the resurrection consisted in parting new life to the soul through acceptance of the gospel. Such a view is on par with the sectarian heresy that the second coming is past, meaning that the Lord already has returned to dwell in the hearts of the faithful. Verse 19, the Lord knoweth them that are his, meaning my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The phrase, let everyone that name, na, let 
everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, meaning that everyone who has taken upon him the name of Christ in the waters of baptism, and then again by partaking to the sacrament, keep the commandments. Verse 20 through 21, in the church there are people of all kinds, good and evil, clean and unclean, righteous and wicked. So live that you shall be numbered with the sanctified, who shall thereby gain salvation and will be of use to the Savior in his work. Verse 22, fleeing youthful lusts. Paul encouraged Timothy to flee also youthful lusts and to sincerely seek after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with a pure heart. Concerning youthful lust, President Gordon B. Hinckley taught, we cannot say it frequently enough. Turn away youthful lust. Stay away from drugs. They can absolutely destroy you. Avoid them as you would a terrible disease, for that is what they become. Avoid foul and filthy talk. It can lead to destruction. Be absolutely honest. Dishonesty can corrupt and destroy. Observe the word of wisdom. You cannot smoke. You must not smoke. You must not chew tobacco. You cannot drink liquor. You must rise above these things which beckon with a seductive call. End of quote. Verses 23 through 25. Avoid debate, argumentation, and criticism that stir up ill feelings. It is better to be gentle and meek. Verse 26. Snare of the devil, meaning all ungodliness. In this case, it was teaching false doctrine. Timothy chapter 3, Paul describes apostasy and perilous times of the last days. Paul speaks here of the dire spiritual darkness that covers the earth in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the seeds of which were even then sprouting among the Meridian Christians. This apostasy, spawned by Satan and nurtured in lust, has increased abound for two millenniums until it is universal and all-pervading until God himself has quoted Paul's very words in describing it, until the perilous times following the restoration of the gospel, until this final period of the earth's temporal continuance in which we now live, and it shall continue until the cup of iniquity overflows, until the Lord shall return to take vengeance on the wicked, until he shall come to destroy and burn and consume every ungodly thing and to usher in his own era of millennial righteousness. The Book of Mormon prophets, also guided by the same spirit that enlightened Paul, testified in some detail of the damning iniquities of the last day. Moroni, for instance, said, there shall be great pollutions upon the face of the earth. There shall be murders, robbings, lyings, deceivings, and whoredoms, and all manner of abominations. Mormon 8.31 but thanks be to God, the first vision rent the veil of darkness, the restored gospel became a standard to rally the righteous, and there is hope again for those who now choose to serve God and keep his commandments, though the whole world and all hell oppose them. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 7. The Aramaic language, that was the language that was spoken by the common people in Israel, even by Christ. Hebrew was only reserved in the synagogue to read the scriptures. The common language of the common man was Aramaic. In the Aramaic version of the New Testament of 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 is a little more expressive and it reads this way. Starting with verse 1, Know this, that in the last days disastrous times will come, and men shall be lovers of themselves and lovers of money proud, conceited blasphemers, disobedient to their own people, ungrateful, wicked, false accusers, addict, addict, addicts to lust, included homosexuality, see 6 Timothy 3, 3, footnote B, brutal, haters of good things, traitors, hasty boasters, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but far from the power of God, from such turn away, for of this sort are those who creep into the house and captivate women sunken in sin, led away with diverse lusts, ever striving to learn and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Boy, if that doesn't describe our day, I don't know what does. 
As we have seen in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Paul prophesied about the terrible difficulties and weaknesses that will cover the earth during the perilous times leading up to the second coming. Note that the footnotes of verses 1 through 7 are helpful in understanding the terms used in these verses. President Boyd K. Packer, the Cormorant's 12 Apostles, spoke about the keys to gaining spiritual safety in the last days. Quote, we live in those perilous times which the Apostle Paul prophesied would come in the last days. If we are to be safe individually as families and secure as a church, it will be through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. End of quote. 2 Timothy 3, 7. Ever learning the philosophies of men, but not receiving the saving truths of revealed religion. Ever learning intellectual abstractions, which purport to show the whence, why, and whether of life, but not turning to God and his prophets to find the simple saving truths. Salvation is not found in much learning. It has little to do with educational degrees and intellectual power. The truth that, sa that save are gospel truths whose source is revelation. Revelation to spiritual people who may or may not be all, also be intellectual. In chapter 8, Janus and Jambres are mentioned. According to Jewish tradition, the magicians who opposed Moses in Pharaoh's court, Exodus 7, 11 through 22, so too are those false teachers of the apostasy like Janus and Jambres, who deny the true God of Israel and the truth. These teachers are leading men and women on to this depravity and wickedness. Verse 9, they, the false teachers and prophets, shall proceed no further, meaning they shall not be able to continue to resist Timothy with success any more than the magicians were capable of finally resisting Moses. Verses 10 through 12, actions speak louder than words. Paul's life speaks for itself. His life was his testimony. Paul had suffered persecution and taught that all who live a Christ-like life would eventually suffer persecution. Verse 13 in chapter 3. The millennium will not be ushered in because men repent and turn to God or because mankind generally becomes more upright and wholesome. Sin and evil shall increase from day to day until the Lord comes. Every form of corruption shall exceed its counterpart of the past until the cup of iniquity shall be full. Then the Lord shall return to cleanse the vineyard, and the wicked shall be destroyed. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, the scripture provide instruction in righteousness. According to Paul, the holy scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. These admonitions help us understand the importance of teaching the scriptures to our children. Elder David A. Bednar spoke about how scripture study brings divine direction and protection. Quote, the scriptures contain the words of Christ and are a reservoir of living water to which we have ready access and from which we can drink deeply and long. You and I must look to and come unto Christ who is the fountain of all living waters studying, searching, and feasting upon the words of Christ as they contain the whole as they contain in the Holy Scriptures. By doing so we can receive both spiritual direction and protection during our mortal journey. End of quote. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, Any message, whether written or spoken, that comes from God to man by the power of the Holy Ghost is Scripture. If it is written and accepted by the church, it becomes part of the scriptures or standard works and here, ever thereafter may be read and studied with profit. <clears throat> Much of what is in the scriptures was given orally in the first instance and was thereafter recorded either by the uttering prophet or an inspired scribe. Other portions of what is in Holy Writ were written by the inspired authors by way of revelation and commandment. The elders of the church are sent forth to proclaim the everlasting gospel by the Spirit of the living God, and they are commanded to speak as they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And whatsoever they shall speak and moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be scripture. 
and shall be the will of the Lord, and shall be the mind of the Lord, and shall be the word of the Lord, and shall be the voice of the Lord, and the power of God unto salvation. Doctrine and Covenants 68, 1 through 4. End of President or Elder McConkie's quote. Second Timothy 4 preach the word. What message do the Lord's minister bear? What should they preach? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the word, the truths of salvation, as recorded in the revelations. How sobering is Paul's charge. In God's holy name, the command is to preach divine, sound doctrine, saving doctrine, the doctrine of Christ. These shall be their teachings, the Lord commands in this day, teaching the principles of my gospel, which were in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon and in the fullness of my scriptures, Dr. Covenants 42, 12 through 15. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, false teachers. Paul's words in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, foreshadowed the coming of the great apostasy when people would not endure sound doctrine, but instead would seek after false teachers who would say what their listening, itching ears, which their listeners' itching ears wanted to hear. The reference to itching ears might be more easily understood as describing those who choose to listen only to those things that they wish to hear. Verse 2, Timothy was to preach the word and rebuke those who are out of season, meaning out of step with true doctrine. Verse 3, the time was coming when members would not endure sound doctrine, but seek teachings who would teach what they wanted to hear. Verse 4, they would turn away from the truth and into fables. All false doctrines are fables. That is, they are stories which have been imagined, fabricated, and invented as opposed to the gospel which is real and true. Early leaders knew that the greatest threat to the church <clears throat> was not outside opposition, but inside corruption. And so it is the same today. Verse 5, he was to be watchful of the corruption that was coming into the church and to endure afflictions and do the work of an evangelist. Joseph Smith said an evangelist is a patriarch, even the oldest man of the blood of Joseph or the seed of Abraham. Whenever the church of Christ is established in the earth, there should be a patriarch for the benefit of the posterity of the saints as it was with Jacob in giving his patriarchal blessings unto his sons. End of quoting Joseph Smith. Timothy 4, 6 through 8, I have fought a good fight. Knowing that the end of his life was approaching, Paul wrote that he was ready to be offered, implying he was ready to give up his life as a sacrifice to the Lord. He then used the metaphor of a victorious athlete to describe the completion of his mission. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Elder Joseph B. Worthen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught about how church members can faithfully finish their course. Quote, Enduring to the end means that we have planted our lives firmly on gospel soil, staying in the mainstream of the church, humbly serving our fellow men, living Christ-like lives, and keeping our covenants. Those who endure are balanced, consistent, humble, constantly improving, and without guile. Their testimonies is not based on worldly reasons. It is based on truth, knowledge, experience, and the Spirit. End of quote. Paul's calling and election had become sure. He was sealed up into eternal life. And since no man is or can be exalted alone, this is one of the crowning reasons why we know Paul was married. He was aware that his life work was finished and that his departure was at hand. Our knowledge of his execution in Rome comes from early sources. One records that Rome is the city where Paul endures a passion like the Lord's and where Paul wins his crown in death like John the Baptist. Another declares that Paul is beheaded and in Rome he springs to life again ennobled by martyrdom. Eusebius Eusebius, quoting an earlier source, states that to this the Rome Tertullian refer the Roman Tertullian refers to the following terms. Study your records. There you will find that Nero was the first to persecute this teaching when, after subjugating the entire East, and Rome especially, he treated everyone with savagery. That such a man was author of our chastisement fills us with pride. For anyone who knows him can understand that anything not supremely good would never have been condemned by Nero. So it came about that this man, referring to Paul, the first to be 
Harold, as a conspicuous fighter against God, was led on to murder the apostles. Oh, I'm sorry, it was referring to Nero. It is recorded in his reign, Paul was beheaded in Rome in itself, and, like, and that Peter likewise was crucified. Timothy 4.8, crown of righteousness. Continue with this metaphor, comparing himself to a triumphant athlete, Paul spoke about the crown of righteousness that was laid up for him, a reference to the crowns of olive branches that were given to the victors in ancient Greek athletic contests. Paul then pointed out that an eternal crown would be given to all saints who righteously endure to the end and prepare for the second coming of the Lord. Paul testified that throughout his persecution, the Lord stood with him and strengthened him as he preached the gospel. Verse 10, Demas loved this present world, meaning Satan gained the victory. Demas was overcome by the world. Verse 11, Mark is profitable to me for the ministry. Paul and Mark had once been missionary companions. Then amid the tensions and trials of that early day, sharp contention rose between them and they went their separate ways. That thereafter they reconciled their differences and again shared the full confidence and love of each other is evident from Mark's association with Paul in Rome when the epistle to the Colossians was written and from this present expression of commendation which flowed from the pen of Paul. Verse 13, that cloak, meaning was the cloak needed for the winter in a cold prison. Parchments could have been copies of scriptures, the Old Testament, or possibly copies of his own writings or memos or membership lists of various branches of the church. Verse 14, Alexander, may be the same Alexander mentioned in 1 Timothy 1.20 in conjunction with Hymenesis. He had eventually been an opponent of St. Paul's teaching. Chapter, verse 16, the apostle mentions the circumstances of his first court appearance before his judgment. My first answer phrase, meaning it would seem that Paul's case had been partly heard, but that the evidence had been insufficient for condemnation, and the hearing had been adjourned. Verse 17, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. Even in these dire circumstances, Paul used the occasion to testify about Jesus Christ in the imperial court. The phrase, I was delivered from the lion's mouth, meaning, since as a Roman citizen, Paul could not be thrown to the lions in the amphitheater. This might be a figurative way of saying that his first hearing did not result in an immediate guilty verdict. Verse 18, Paul knew he had a sure inheritance of eternal life in the highest heaven of the celestial world. Verse 28, times 21, after the martyrdom of Paul and Peter, the first man to be appointed bishop of Rome was Linus. He is mentioned by Paul when writing to Timothy from Rome in a salutation at the end of the epistle. Let's now go to Titus chapters 1 through 3. Titus is the epistle of obedience. Writing in his old age, Paul seems increasingly impressed by the Spirit to counsel his beloved Titus and through him all saints of the overpowering need to walk in the paths of truth and righteousness. Paul wrote that the hopes of eternal life was first promised by God in the pre-earth life before the world began. He taught that the saints should look forward to that blessed hope of exaltation and to the second coming. Paul also wrote to Titus about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, alluding to the ordinance of baptism and the purifying effect of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, both of which are preparatory to being made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul's inspired counsel reminds modern Christians that the doctrines and ordinances of the gospel bring hope or eternal life or it should be hope of eternal life. True, he affirms as everlastingly he must in the day when the doctrine of Christ is being introduced anew to a pagan world that salvation comes by God's grace. But his emphasis is upon what the saints must do after baptism to gain the glory that comes by grace. Titus is written to and for the saints. It is a sermon of practical exhortation to those in the fold, a common sense approach to the problems of living in the world without being of the world. 
Paul is thus writing in effect to the saints today and is the never failing effect of the words of the great theologian apostle his words are as new and living now as when first recorded on the parchments of antiquity. The epistle of Titus provides the earliest evidence that the church had been established on the Greek Isle of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea. Titus had the responsibility of calling new bishops on the island. Paul listed some of the spiritual qualifications for bishops. In addition, Paul gave specific advice to men, women, and servants on proper behavior for saints. Titus 1.1, an apostle according to God's elect. As one of a host of faithful spirits from pre-existence, all of whom receive a like blessing, Paul was foreordained to gain eternal life, including which was, which is the fact he was foreordained to believe the gospel, to be baptized, to receive the Melchizedek priesthood, to be married for eternity, and to make his colony election sure, all of which he did. Verse 2, Premortality. In Titus 1-2, Paul spoke of eternal life, which God promised before the world began. This verse, along with other passages in the Bible, attests that we live before we were born into mortality. Titus 1-3, in due times, manifested his word through through preaching, which is committed unto me. That phrase meaning God's word for his church will come through his apostle, the senior apostle being the head. Titus 1, 4 through 5, Titus was a true follower of the gospel, or of Paul, or Paul would put it, mine own son after the common faith. He was left in Crete to set in order the church as the presiding officer and to other elders. Titus 1, 6 through 8, blameless, the husband of one wife, meaning church leaders, elders and bishops were to be blameless, meaning innocent or not guilty of sin not self-willed, arrogant, slow to anger, not given to wine, free of abuse, does not preach for money, but loves his members, loves what is good and sober, regular, calm, not under the influence of passion, that's what sober means, providing justice, holy, meaning separated or set apart for a specific purpose, and has self-control. From the days of Adam to the present, from this hour to the end of the peopling of the world, the law of God has been, is, and shall be that men should have one wife at one time and one wife only, except when God by revelation specifically directs otherwise. Thus in March of 1831, the Lord said to Joseph Smith, It is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, and all that this that the earth might answer the end of its creation and that it might be filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was made the nc 49 16-17 thus also the word of the lord in the day of nephi was there shall not any man among you save it be among you have save it be one wife and concubines he shall have none for i the lord god delight in the chaste women and whoredoms are an abomination before me thus saith the lord of hosts For if I will, saith the Lord, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. At proper and appointed times, the Lord has, of course, given the revelation and issues the command of directing certain persons to enter plural marriage in the new and everlasting covenant. Doctrine and Covenant, section 132. Titus 1, 9, sound doctrines, and verse 13, sound in faith, meaning... Godly conduct grows out of gospel teachings. Ethical practices are born of true gospel principles. Revealed truth begets righteous living. Right living is a child of true teachings. And and conversely, false doctrine breeds conduct that is not of God. Belief in false principles results in practices based on error. Man-made doctrine has no saving power. Thus, sound doctrine is essential to salvation, and sound doctrine comes from God by revelation. Those who believe the gospel are the only ones who will or can live its laws. Men are baptized, married for eternity, and conformed to every divine law because they believe the truth. Verse 10 through 11, teaching for filthy lucre's sake. Paul warned Titus about unruly and vain talkers and deceivers who sought after filthy lucre. Filthy lucre refers to money obtained through dishonest means. Dishonest people often teach things which they ought not. 
for money and the praise of the world. The Book of Mormon refers to this activity as priestcraft, 2 Nephi 26-29. He commandeth that there shall be no priestcraft, for behold, priestcrafts are they that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain, money, and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. Titus 1, 10 through 11. Here begins the arraignment of the false teachings what the elders will have to meet. They of circumcision, that is, Jewish converts, who insisted that to be a Christian one must also submit to Jewish ordinances, who were subverting the work of the true gospel through teaching false teachings for the sake of money. Verse 11. Teaching for filthy lucre's sake. How true and sad it is that almost all false teachers are motivated more by money than by a desire to make the word of God available freely, without money and without price. A paid ministry has always received its reward. Truly the labor in Zion shall labor for Zion, for if they labor for money, they shall perish. Chapter 1 verse 12, a prophet of their own. Epimenides, who lived about 600 B.C. and who, as a witness or teacher, as a professing preacher of righteousness, who did not have the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus, was therefore a false prophet. The Cretans were always liars. Historically, Cretans had a reputation for a vic I'm not sure how to pronounce this, a vicariousness instability or inordinate passion for property. As the Corinthians were renowned for dissolute living, so the Cretans were famed for dishonesty. Their most well-known false belief, the truth of which even their own prophets ridiculed, was that Zeus was buried in Crete. Historically, the word Cretan came, from, came to be synonymous with dishonesty. The term slow bellies in this verse is better translated as idle bellies and carries the idea of lazy gluttony. Titus 1.14, Jewish fables, that whole body of Jewish belief and practices which leads men away from that salvation which is in Christ. Titus 1.14-15, unto the pure all things were pure. Church members in Crete had apparently been influenced by Jewish teachings that some things were either ritually pure or impure. In Titus 1.15, Paul taught that unto the pure all things are pure, meaning that purity is an inner spiritual condition that cannot be affected by touching or partaking of something that has been declared to be ritually unclean. The Joseph Smith translation of Titus 1.15 reads, Unto the pure let all things be pure. First Titus Titus 1, 5 footnote, I'm sorry, Titus 1, 15 footnote 8. Them that are defiled and unbelieving, meaning those who either reject or depart from the truth, choosing rather to live after the manner of the world with all its carnal sensuality and devilishness. Titus 1, 16, since God can be known only by revelation from the Holy Ghost, and since this Holy Ghost can be received only, only as a result of righteousness, it follows that those who are disobedient to God's laws do not and cannot know him. Titus chapter 2, saints should live righteously, deny ungodliness, and seek the Lord. Paul's doctrine here and everywhere records is this, Recorded as this, salvation comes by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. To the saints, his everlasting counsel is obey, obey, obey. Keep the commandments, earn the attributes of godliness, and then, and then only, cometh salvation. Titus 2, 1 through 12, the effects of sound doctrine. Because false teachers were creeping in among the saints on the Isle of Crete, Paul urged Titus to teach sound doctrine. Paul then gave several examples of how true doctrine will guide the behavior of men and women, old, young, and servants. President Dallin H. Oak stretched the value of teaching the doctrine of the gospel, quote, we taught doctrines and principles, well-taught doctrines and principles have a more powerful influence on behavior than rules. When we teach gospel doctrines and principles, we can qualify for the witness and guidance of the Spirit to reinforce our teachings. End of quote.
President Boyd K. Packer also taught, True doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve the behavior quicker than the study of behavior will improve behavior. Preoccupation with unworthy behavior can lead to unworthy behavior. That is why we stress so forcefully the study of the doctrines of the gospel. End of quote. How True Doctrines Will Guide Our Behavior Chapter 2, Verse 2 It will help us become sober, which means regular, calm, not under the influence of passion, grave, meaning to be venerated for character, temperate, meaning curbing one desire and impulse of self-control, and becoming sound in faith, charity, and patience. Two, chapter 2, Verses 3-5 through five, The mature woman in the church, those with faith and spiritual stature are to teach the younger women to live the gospel, to acquire the attributes of godliness, and to care for the families. The phrase keepers at home, meaning guards, they are to guard the family from the wiles of the devil. As Helaman 3.29.30 put it, Yea, we see that whosoever will may lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and the snares and the wiles of the devil, and lead the man of Christ in a straight and narrow course across that everlasting gulf of misery, which is prepared to engulf the wicked and land their souls, yea, their immortal souls, at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven, to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and with all the holy fathers to go no more out. How to do <clears throat> verses 6 to 8. Verse 6, young men will also be helped with being sober-minded. Verse 7, it will enable us to be good examples of good works, being uncorrupted by the things of the word, developing gravity, honor, purity, being sincere, genuineness, in contrast of putting on a front to appear to be righteous, instead having integrity. Verse 8, being sound in their speech, meaning teaching which does not deviate from the truth, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you. Chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, And those saints who are slaves are to be so taught that their lives will be patterns of Christian living, not prolonging, misappropriating, or robbing. Titus 2.11, Salvation comes by the grace of God and is offered to all men. Titus 2.12-13, The whole gospel system is designed to enable men to turn from evil and attain righteousness by obedience to the Lord's law. Salvation is free only in the sense that it is freely available. Every blessing, other than the fact of resurrection, must be earned by obedience. Deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength is the eternal counsel of all the prophets of all ages. Moroni 10, 32. Verse 13, that blessed hope, meaning the second coming of the Messiah, which seemingly the meridian saints assumed was near at hand. The great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, meaning our great and Savior Jesus Christ, it is the Son, not the Father, and not both of them, who shall return at the consummation of that blessed hope. Titus 2.14, Peculiar People Paul told Titus that Christ gave himself for us so that we would become a peculiar people, faithful members of the church who have taken upon themselves the names of Christ and been adopted into his family. Ye are the children of the Lord your God, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth. Manifestly such a people as certified by their way of life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation are deemed by worldly people to be peculiar. It's Titus 3, saints must live righteously after baptism. Chapter 3, verse 1, them, meaning those who have joined the church and who are thus under covenant to live as becometh saints. The phrase, principalities, powers, magistrates, Going along with the 12th art of faith, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, magistrates, and obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. 
every good work, that phrase meaning to be saved, the saints after baptism must keep the commandments. Mosiah 31, 19 through 20 says, And now, my beloved brethren, after you have gotten into the straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for you have not come this far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope, and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye press forward feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. You get the sense out of all this we have done thus so far, and I know this has been long. Have you noticed that the emphasis is we must have our focus on Christ? Everything has to be about Christ. Our focus, our lives, our thoughts, our attitudes, our, everything must be focused on Christ. To obey magistrates, meaning the original meaning of the Greek word is to obey one's superiors. Of course, this means in righteousness. No one is under obligation to obey anyone in unrighteousness. Titus 3.2, the New International Version translation is clearer. To slander no, no one, that should be no one, to be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility towards all men. Showing humility does not mean one is a doormat to be walked on, but to be kind, patient, without envy, not puffed up with pride, and is not easily provoked. Titus 3.3, 3, For we as saints before our conversions were under the influence of the world and its negative attributes of foolishness, disobedience, deceitfulness, controlled by lust and pleasures of the world, living in a way that benefited only ourselves and our desires. Titus 3, 4, but after becoming new creatures in Christ through baptism, if it was sincere and with real intent, our perception of others and our behaviors changed that showed the love of God in our being. Titus 3, 5, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost is referring to, in Titus 3, 5, Paul wrote that we are saved through Christ's mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The washing of regeneration is baptism. The Greek word translation, translated as regeneration suggests the idea of recreation. A baptism, at baptism, a person enters into a covenant relationship with Christ and is created anew in a sinless state, becoming a new creature. Just as a newborn is given a name, those who are baptized take upon themselves a new name, the name of Jesus Christ, and covenant to strive to live like him. Elder Christoffel Golden Jr. of the 70s spoke about the sanctifying effect of the Holy Ghost, quote, Only the atonement can rid man of sin, making one justified in the sight of God. Afterward comes the gift of sanctification, being made clean, pure, and spotless, which can only be dispensed through the power of the Holy Ghost on conditions of obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Paul himself testified that he had been baptized for remission of sins and reminded Titus that we should be saved not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. End of quote. Titus 3.6, which Holy Ghost was shed upon them in the abundance through the Savior. Titus 3, 7, being justified by his grace, is to become innocent again, not guilty of sin through repentance and because of the loving kindness of the Savior. Titus 3, 8, faithful sayings, that is, a condensed re reflection. Faithful sayings show that a religious movement is no longer in its infancy. Men have reflected about it for some time. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Titus 3.9 There is no converting power in debate and contention. Christ's ministers are to teach, not to argue. Missionaries go forth, for instance, to declare glad tidings with this restriction. Of tentance thou shalt not talk. 
meaning they are to teach and explain the basic doctrines of salvation and not engage in contentions and strivings about the doctrines of sectarianism. Genealogy in this phrase, linked here with contentions and strivings about the law of Moses, these refer to the false Jewish traditions that salvation was for the chosen seed as such was known by genealog genealogical recitations. In this dispensation, the Lord has commanded genealogical research as an essential requisite in making salvation available to those who do not have opportunity to receive the gospel in this life. In Paul's day, the Jewish Christians <clears throat> or just Jews themselves were using genealogies to puff themselves up. Titus 3, 10 through 11. There comes a time when it is wise to shun and avoid, and avoid those who rebel against the light and whose hearts are set on promulgating false and damning doctrines. A modern illustration of such is those cultists who leave the church to advocate and practice plural marriage in a day when the president of the church has withdrawn from all men the power to perform these marriages. Titus 3, 12 through 14. As soon as I sent Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Now to the book of Philemon, our last book. Philemon is perhaps the most personal of all of Paul's letters and certainly illustrates the fact that when people join the church of Jesus Christ, they become brothers and sisters in the gospel. One principle that Paul taught Philemon was that when a person is offended or hurt by another, it is the injured person's duty to forgive the wrongdoer. Paul wrote this epistle to Philemon, a Greek convert who probably lived in Colossia, he allowed a church congregation to meet in his home. Philemon owned a slave named Onesimus who had run away from Philemon and then sought help from Paul. Onesimus subsequent, subsequently converted to the gospel. Paul wrote to Philemon to encourage him to receive Onesimus back without the severe punishments that would usually be inflicted on a runaway slave. Paul said that Onesimus had changed from being unprofitable to profitable for both Paul and Philemon, and, the, and that Philemon should therefore receive him. More significantly, Paul suggested that Onesimus was now a beloved brother since he had come unto the Lord. Paul even offered to make up any financial loss suffered by Philemus because of Onesimus being unprofitable. In this letter, Paul neither approved nor opposed the institution of slavery. In the New Testament Judeo-Christian culture, slavery or servitude was accepted as a part of society, but instead he emphasized how Philemon's identity as a Christian ought to dictate the way he treated his servants. God is no respecter of persons, and few things are of lesser consequence than social caste or status. Rather, he invited them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denied none that Come unto him, black, white, bond or free, male or female, and he remembered the heathen, and all are alike unto God. Philemon 1 1, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, imprisoned because of the testimony of Christ and the work of his ministry. Philemon 1 2, Aphia is the name of a woman who, many, who may have been Philemon's wife. Archippus, Archippus, Archippus may have been a local leader of the church. Philemon 1, 3-4, Paul was grateful of those faithful members whom he diligently prayed for. Philemon 1, 5-6, Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. The phrase effectual by the acknowledging means effectual and leading to the recognition on Philemon's part of all the blessings which Christians have. 
in you includes both already in your possession and within your reach. An understanding of how exalted is the privilege of salvation through Christ is the crown and culmination of faith and involves a knowledge of the deeper mysteries of God, which can only be known by revelation. It is moreover essential to soundness of Christian life and to the Christian enthusiasm on which security against temptation depends. In Christ, meaning loosely added without exact indication of relation to the preceding in order to point out that as the object of faith is Christ, so only through a relation to Christ is love, active, or knowledge possible, or every good thing which is the object of knowledge to be valued. Philemon 1, 7, 12, and 20, the phrase bowels are refreshed refers to hearts having been refreshed, that is, through the charitable acts prompted by Philemon's love. The original Greek word translated as bowels refers to one's inner parts, meaning one's feelings and affections. Some modern Bible translators have chosen to translate this word as heart rather than bowels. When Paul spoke of the saints, bowels and his own bowels being refreshed, he was referring to their hearts being comforted and their emotions heightened by others. Philemon 1, 8, 9, and 18, Paul's appeal to Philemon. Once must, was a runaway slave who belonged to Philemus. Once must had fled to where Paul was in prison and was subsequently converted to the gospel. Paul then wrote to Philemon to admonish him to receive once must back as a brother beloved. Paul explained that he had chosen not to use his authority as apostle of Jesus Christ to demand that Philemon do that, which is convenient, to receive one's must back. Instead, Paul simply requested that Philemon honor his wishes because of Paul's advanced age and his suffering as a prisoner. It may seem strange that Paul would suggest that Philemon might accept one's must back because it was convenient. However, at the time the King James Version of the Bible was produced, convenient could mean suitable or fitting. The original Greek word translated as convenient is formed from a verb meaning to come up to, and the term carries the idea of measuring up to a certain mark or standard. Paul's use of the word hints that Philemon should forgive one's must because it was the most fitting or becoming thing for a true follower of Christ to come up to. Paul then set an example of Christian charity when he offered to personally compensate Philemon for any financial loss that resulted from Onesimus' actions. Philemon 1, 10 14 That I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have you like to keep him with me so that he could take your place and help me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you did would not seem forced but would be voluntarily. Philemon 1, 15 through 15.4 meaning introduces a further consideration in favor of sending the slave back. He therefore departed, was therefore parted from thee in the providence of God, therefore refers to the divine purpose that thou shouldest have him forever, meaning an eternal possession, not by legal bond, but by Christian fellowship. Verse 16, servant, slave in the flesh, slave in the flesh. this seems to imply that in the past, one of us had had kindly treatment and friendship. These old associations should now, in his repentance, make him even more dear to Philemon than he can be to Paul. This is said in order to make bitterness towards the former ungrateful runaway an impossibility. The phrase in the Lord, meaning through your common relation to Christ, verse 17, a partner, one who shares. This partner is further described in 1 Corinthians 1 9 partnership in common relation to his son, Jesus Christ. Philemon 1, 18-21, Paul is willing to make up any financial loss to Philemon, but he includes a subtle note about the leverage 
he has sinned, Philemon owes infinitely more to Paul. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will even that you will do even more than I ask. Philemon is the shortest of Paul's epistles. It is a letter addressed to a private individual such it does not include much doctrinal content. Nevertheless, Paul's plea for Philemon to reconcile with the slave Onesimus illustrates how the doctrines of the gospel apply to daily life. In this case, showing that our relationship with Jesus Christ brings us into a familial relationship with all other followers of Christ and highlights the importance of mercy and forgiveness in Christian living. Thank you, brother and sister, for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button. May we make our central focus the focus on Christ. Make everything about him and submit our will to him, and we will live with him once again. Thank you.